All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I don't know if you can hear in the background, but it is raining where I am at. I don't know what it's like where you are at, but not the, the greatest weather here. But anywho, let us hop in uh, before we get to chapter five, which is the women of Troy. We're going to quickly review what we had last time. So we recall what's going on. So the Greeks and the Trojans, they finally came face to face on the battlefield, but only two people fought. And that was Menelaus of Sparta. And then, of course, our guy Paris of Troy. Now, as they were fighting or actually before they were fighting, both sides had agreed that whoever wins out of this battle basically gets Helen. And then both sides just go home. So that was the agreement. Now, as they were fighting, though, Paris was on the low end. Like Menelaus was about to, I would say, maybe kill him. But Aphrodite came in and tore Paris magically out of the battle. Like nobody even saw what happened. Right now, when Helen met up with Paris later, she was basically disgusted by this. Like you're basically looking at Paris like he's a weakling or something and you ran away from battle. Uh, So she really wanted to leave him. But Aphrodite, again, used her magic and she put a spell on Helen so that she would not leave. All right. So that is where we were at last time. So now we're hopping into chapter five, the women of Troy. Put that up there. The women of Troy. All right. So here we go. The women of Troy. The war might have ended that day, even so, for the truce still held between the war hosts and made a breathing space in which men might have talked peace with each other. But Athena, on the side of the Greeks, determined that the truce or the promise must be broken. She put it into the head of Pandarus, one of the princes among Troy's allies, that it would be a fine and valiant or brave thing to shoot down Menelaus and so be done with one of the foremost or highest of the Greek leaders. So Pandarus knocked an arrow to his great horn bow and drew and loosed or let go. And the arrow thumbed on its way. So that picture that's up there, that is Pandarus, Pandarus, whatever, however you pronounce this guy's name, pulling the arrow back and letting it go. And it went and drove through the king's breastplate and drew the red blood. When Agamemnon heard that his brother was wounded, he cried out that if Menelaus died, the army would lose heart and return home and the Trojans would dance for joy on his grave. Menelaus quieted him as though he were a startled horse. Nay, do not be putting fear into the war host. See, the arrow has not gone deep and will come out with little harm done. And so it was proved when Makawan, the healer of the Greek war host, kind of like their doctor, came to draw forth the barb. So he was going to pull the barb of that arrow out. Ugh. Nevertheless, the truth had been, the truce had been broken and men were putting their armor on again. And the horn sounded for battle. The first full battle in all the long years of the war. So it's like, it's wartime. Everybody's getting their their battle gear on and they're about to fight. The two great war hosts broke forward across the open space between. The Trojans and their allies loud as a flock of birds, shouting in all their different tongues. The Greeks in grim and deadly silence. They charged together, crashing shield upon shield, as when mountain torrents come together in spate, rush together, and set the crags ringing and echoing. So you can just hear this noise. People are hitting each other, clamoring together. This way and that, the battle line swayed as thrust answered thrust, and the long ranks began to separate into whirlpools and back eddies, such as form when the torrents meet. Each eddy a smaller battle of its own in which men fought each other, eye to eye and blade to blade, on foot or from chariots. So you can imagine some, like, there, she's making it seem like these masses of people are kind of like waves crashing against each other. They're fighting like that. And where a man fell, there a struggle would gather about him as the enemy strove to drag his body aside and strip him of the armor that was theirs by right of conquest. And his friends stood over him, fighting to keep his body from dishonor. So when somebody fell and died, then the people would try to rip off the armor and take this nice armor for their own. 
and then the people that wanted to protect the body would try to pull the body away to save it so it doesn't get torn apart. It was pretty gross when these battles were going on. The dust rolled up so that both war hosts were parched or dry and whitened with it. And men went down before the fights of arrows and throw stones that came upon them from all sides. So there's arrows and stones and you're just being and you got to try to get away from them. Scary times. Through it all, Diomedes of the loud war cry with his battle drunkenness upon him. So he was so excited. Not that he was actually drunk like he had been drinking alcohol, but he's just so excited to battle. Um, he went raging up and down the plain, leaving dead behind him as a flooded river leaves the torn off limbs of trees. Pandarus loosed one of his deadly arrows against him as he swept by. But though it took him in the shoulder, it did no deeper harm than the shaft that he had loosed at Menelaus. And when Diomedes had called a friend to pull out the barb right out of his shoulder, pull it out. He turned back on Pandarus with a mighty spear cast whoosh, that took him full in the face and sent him sprawling into dust and darkness. So he took a spear right into the face. That guy is no longer. He's gone. He's dead. I'll show you this picture in a moment of the next page. The way, this way and that, the battle flowed as, as Hector with Sarpedon, lord of the Lycians, at his side, forced the Greeks back almost to their ships, only to be swept back in their turn by Odysseus and Diomedes. But as the red day wore on, the tide of battle began to run more and more strongly for the Greeks and against the Trojans and their allies until the war hosts of Troy were fighting desperately with their backs almost to the city gates. So throughout the day, it's going this way and that. One side's a little bit stronger. The other side gets a little stronger. But at this point, the Trojans are backed up against almost where they live, and the Greeks are coming at them strong. Then the foremost of the Trojan soothsayers, or that like fortune teller, um, came to Hector, where he stood at the bloody heart of things and bade him leave his command to Aeneas and go back within the city to his mother, the queen. So leave everything to your other, this other guy here, Aeneas, and you go back inside and go to your mother. Bid her gather her women, said the soothsayer, and take the most splendid of all her jeweled robes and go up to the temple of gray-eyed Athena and lay it across the knees of the sacred statue. And pray to Athena to cease or stop from giving all her strength to the Greeks. And show mercy to the people of Troy, who are her people also. So, unwillingly, he's not happy to do it, Hector left Aeneas in command and strode back to the city gate. And as he went, the rim of his great oxide shield kept knocking against his heels and the back of his neck at every step as though it would hurry him on his way. So back then they might have hung these really heavy, huge shields on their back as they walked. Inside the city, he went straight to the royal palace of his father, King Priam, in the high citadel. His mother met him in the gateway with a brimming wine cup in her hands and would have had him drink and pour an offering to the gods. But Hector told her gently, Nay, mother, I am filthy from the battlefields and my hands too fouled or dirty to, to be pouring offerings to the gods. I bring you a message from the lookers into dark places, so that fortune teller. And when it is given, I must be away back to the fighting without delay. And when he had repeated to her the words of the soothsayer, he took his leave of her and went his way. But he did not at once return to the battle. First, he went across the palace courts to the house that their father, the king, had built for his brother, Paris, thinking to speak a few words with Helen for kindness' sake. There, in the high chamber, he found his brother fussing over his armor and playing with his great bow, like a girl making ready for a party, instead of arming himself for the war host. And at the far end of the room, Helen was working with her maidens at a rich tapestry on the loom. Her back was to him, and all the air in the chamber hummed with anger. So let me show you this. So you can see Helen there on the loom. Get my phone. Stop. 
Standing in the doorway, Hector spoke to his brother. Under the city walls, men are dying because of the evil that you brought ten years ago. Up now, leave this plane with your weapons, as though they were toys. Get your armor on and join them out there. Paris smiled at him, the smile that so often turned away men's wrath, and getting up, reached for his breastplate. My brother, there is justice in your harsh words, but it is not cowardice that has held me here. Grief for my ill-doing has made me weak, and I was only seeking a few breaths of time to gather my strength before going out again among my sword companions. All that you say, Helen has but now been saying to me, and behold, you find me in the act of putting on my war gear. So he's basically like, I was just about, I was getting ready. I thought I was getting ready here to go fight. Helen said without turning around, if the gods were kinder, I would not find myself bound to one who must be urged to battle by his woman. Then she got up and swept colored wools from the stool beside her and bade or asked Hector to sit for a while. But Hector shook his head. I go now to take leave of my, my wife and have little enough time for that. Get this fellow armed and roused for action, and maybe he will catch up with me before I leave the city. And out he strode to his own house. But Andromache, his wife, was not there. Her maidens told him that, Hearing of the Trojans driven back and the Greeks near to victory, she had gone running to the sea gate like a wild thing, and the nurse with her carrying their baby. And there, following them, Hector found her on the roof of the gate tower, with the babe Astinanax cuddled in his nurse's arms. Andromache came running to him and caught his hand, weeping and begging him not to go back into battle. If you go back, it is your death, and you will not return to us again. Like enough, Hector said. That is why I have come to say goodbye. At this she wept yet more wildly. I have no father, nor yet a mother. And my seven brothers went down to the dark kingdom of Hades all on the same day. But you have been father and mother and brothers to me, as well as my beloved husband. And now it seems that I must lose you all. Have pity on me and on your baby son. You have fought enough. Stay with us now. Hector shook his head, and the high horsehair crest of his helmet tossed sideways on the wind along the battlements. I cannot bide here or stay here with you, for there is another fate upon me. It is not that I love you too little. Oh no, never that. I know in my heart that at the time comes when Troy will be laid low and all my father's people. But my grief for that is less than my grief for you, who, when that day comes, will be carried away captive to weave at the loom in some stranger woman's house and carry water and slavery from a foreign well. May I be dead by then and the earth heaped over me, that I, may, that I may not hear them carry you away. So Hector is basically saying, I need to fight because if they win and they carry you away as a slave, I, I just couldn't take that. It's too much for me. He reached out to take his little son in his arms, but the babe shrank back, scared by the great bronze helmet with its nodding horsehair crest. Hector laughed then and Andromache with him for all her grief. He took off the frightening helmet and set it on the ground. Then Astinanax, I think I'm getting that right, the baby's name, went to him happily. So here's a picture of them all together. Hector dandled him in his arms and kissed him and prayed aloud to the gods for the boy's future. So kind of like, Protect my son to all the gods up there, he's praying. Then he gave him back to Andromache, his arms for the moment around them both, holding as though he did not know how to let them go. Dear, cease the weeping. Go back to your women 
and set them to women's work. War is the work for men. And he picked up his helmet and he went away. So that is the end of chapter five. So it's crazy times here. Um, he's going into battle and it looks like things are going to get pretty serious soon. So as always, I'm going to ask you a couple questions and then uh, let's do a face. So first question. So when the men fell to the ground during battles, this is back in ancient Greece, um, Homer, the, the author back then, uh, says that men tried to keep their friends' bodies from dishonor. Like, what do you think this means? So I want to keep my, my friend's body from being dishonored. And then why would they not want their bodies, their friend's bodies to be dishonored? It's just a body, right? The person's no longer alive. Why would that be important to them? So that's one question. And then at the end there, Hector said this quote. He said, war is the work for men. So basically that fighting is not for girls. Do you agree with that line of Hector's? And then if yes, why? And if no, why not? Okay, and now the face. So this is a kind of sensitive one. It's Andromache when Hector says he's leaving for battle. Now, so keep in mind, um, she might never see him again. And he's her husband. He's the father of the, her child. And she just loves him so much. And she might never see him again. So this is her saying goodbye. Okay, so here's my face. And after you do yours, okay? So I like to exaggerate my faces a little bit. I think it's fun, but you do whatever you want. Super realistic, exaggerate, up to you, as always. All right, well, I'm going to see you next time I'm going to get out of here. Hopefully I'm not going to get too drenched in the rain when I take my little doggy out in the moment. Um, the next chapter, though, I just want to tell you the name. The High King's Embassy. So the, his kind of people. So we'll see what that's all about next time. Adios.